the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the creation of the Swedish Flying Barrel, tactics and strategy, heat rounds and when to use them, and Metal Beasts, an outstanding Soviet helicopter. The Update 1.93 brought a whole series of modern machines into the game, and got its name in honor of one of them. Meet the Soviet Attack Helicopter K-50, also known as the Black Shark. It is lifted into the air by a pair of coaxial rotors driven by two engines, each with a capacity of 2,200 horsepower. Aluminium armor covers the cockpit and fuel tanks. In addition, the cabin is protected by 20 millimeters of bulletproof glass on three sides. There's only one pilot controlling the machine, and the forward-facing armament is represented by a 30 millimeter quick-firing cannon. But the main thing is, of course, the external payload. The Black Shark's signature weapons are the guided missiles called Vicher, which means whirlwind. They are your primary choice against ground tech as well as against enemy aviation. The fact is that these missiles are equipped with a proximity fuse. Combine it with a huge flight range and you get a perfect weapon for hunting enemy helicopters. The Black Shark can easily destroy any rotorcraft from a distance at which only a few of them are able to fight back. But what about aeroplanes? The Vicar can cope with them as well. And it doesn't matter if your courses are opposed or if you're chasing the opponent in the same direction. In skillful hands, it can sometimes be even more effective than the specialized air-to-air -air Igla missiles. They have their own advantage, though. After you successfully lock onto the target, the homing head will guide the missile to its prey on its own, while you can switch on to other things. This is a more specialized anti-air weapon but you can only carry up to a pair of them, in addition to other armaments. In the fight against ground tech, our choice again is the Vicar. You have 12 missiles with a larger launch range than almost all of the air defense systems in your game, which allow you to stay at a safe distance and destroy unsuspecting enemy tanks. If the enemy doesn't have anti-aircraft guns left and you've run out of ATGMs, you use the 30mm gun with a ground target's belt, as it pierces 72mm of armor from a kilometer away. This should be more than enough for any modern tank, since you're looking at it from above and can aim at turret and engine compartment roofs. The same gun can help you out in a fight against enemy fighters. If your missile somehow missed from a long distance and the enemy is rapidly approaching, a heavy caliber burst of fire will help, if not destroy the target, then at least scare it off, repelling any desire to get into close combat with you. As for the other payload options, there are 250 and 500 kilogram bombs available. But you should probably leave the bombing to the bombers. Specialized aviation will deal with this task a lot more efficiently. And finally, there are 80 unguided missiles with explosive warheads penetrating up to 400 millimeters of armor. They can become a good addition to your forward-facing armament and significantly increase the helicopter's firepower in close-range combat. In terms of tactics, the K-50 is one of the most formidable helicopters in the game, effective against ground vehicles and, at the same time, able to fend for itself in the air. The huge firing range allows it to stay at a safe distance from the main threats, destroying enemy targets with ATGMs. The only thing that do pose some threat are the top anti-aircraft guns with long-range missiles, primarily the American ADATS. Also, don't forget to look around so as not to give an easy frag to the enemy fighters.
Sweden remained neutral in World War II, but it watched the action in Europe closely. And naturally, it tried not to miss out on any potentially interesting technologies and whatnot. Quite a logical standpoint, since neutrality that is not backed up by military power can suddenly cease to exist, and in a most unpleasant way. So the Swedish Air Force reacted swiftly to the onset of a new era of jet combat aviation. In the post-war world, there was a lot to profit from, especially in terms of the latest aviation technologies from the former specialists of Messerschmitt and Focke Wulf. The Swedes received the latest developments in the field of transonic aerodynamics of a compromised swept wing. And Great Britain, that was kind of desperate for money after the war years, eagerly sold the technology of the latest de Havilland Ghost turbojet engine with a centrifugal compressor. So Sweden quite quickly acquired the two main components of its own advanced fighter jet. They still needed to solve numerous issues of the layout of the future aircraft, and there was no one to rely on. The MiG-15 and the Sabre were still in development, and moreover strictly classified. The foreign experience couldn't help, but on the other hand, it didn't bind the hands of the Saab specialists either. They could implement solutions that the designers of the leading world powers in those days couldn't even dream of. Take a look at this. The majority of the first-generation fighter jets have a pipe-like fuselage, with an air intake in the nose. But whatever one may say, a plane can't fly without a pilot, at least at that time. So somewhere in the middle of that fuselage, they had to find room for a cockpit. The duct had to be split in two, and this meant that the air would acquire curvature, and as a result, the power of the turbojet engine would invariably drop. The Swedes decided to go a lot easier about it. They just moved the cockpit upstairs. Yeah, now the aircraft had something of a bull's forehead and more drag, but it was immediately compensated by the increased thrust. In addition, the pilot received a significantly better view. The tail unit was moved back on a special beam in order to shorten the fuselage and reduce the length of the air intake channel. That way, they additionally increased the engine's efficiency. The built-in fuel supply turned out to be quite small. In terms of range, the aircraft had half that of both the MiG and the Sabre. But on the other hand, why does a tactical interceptor of a small country need to have a record combat radius? Take off, shoot things down, land? The future Tanan embodied this concept like no other fighter of those days. Also, its designers added solid fuel boosters to shorten the takeoffs from grass airfields and roads. Then they gave it an afterburner of their own design, not at all inferior to the best world analogues. It was installed on the J-29B, the second modification of this fighter. <laughs> and why not? Look under the tail. There's loads of space to use. Unguided missiles, bombs, air-to-air -air missiles. Over the years, the hunchbacked Tunan has acquired a decent arsenal of payload options. And that's not counting the four guns. First, the 20mm ones, the British Hispano Mark V, and then the terrible 30mm Aiden. England willingly sold all these weapons to neutral Sweden, which was preparing to stop the legions of Soviet bombers potentially coming from the east. The J-29 was produced in small series, but nevertheless, it made a splash in the aviation world of those days. A few years later, the American FJ-4 Fury carrier-based fighter, the Sabre's descendant, had also received a cabin above the intake duct and a distinctive hump profile. Could it be that the aircraft designers of the famous North American looked back at the humble Swedish aircraft? As for the J-29, it's known that a sword in the scabbard forces the other one to remain in the scabbard as well. And in this context of the outbreak of the Cold War, with its many provocations and pushing each other's limits, nobody on either side of the conflict wanted to test the air shield of a neutral kingdom. And before we move on to the next section, let's remind you that the Saab J-29 Tunan has just appeared 
in our gang. In addition to its flying qualities, it has another unexpected property. All the players who buy it will get access to a full Swedish tree with dozens of unique aircraft upon the release of the next update. A heat projectile is an amazing invention. One would think, what's so special about it? It's just an ordinary explosive with a specially shaped hollow space, but it suddenly forms a directed jet. And even steel becomes malleable and behaves like liquid when this jet collides with it. Moreover, neither the firing distance nor the velocity of the projectile affect the penetration rate. In the game, you can find heat shells starting from the lowest rank. The earliest form of a heat round can be fired from the Japanese reserve tank, I Goko. It is quite primitive, low caliber, and unlike the heat rounds on modern tanks, it's stabilized by rotation and not by fin. Another interesting model from the first rank is in the arsenal of the Sturmpanzer II, where the heat projectile looks like an HE round on steroids and isn't very useful against heavily armored targets. The most rapid development of heat ammunition occurred in the post-war years. Their main purpose was damaging heavily armored opponents from a long distance. For example, the APCBC round of the American M46 tank can't penetrate the frontal armor of Soviet heavyweights even at point-blank range, and it doesn't always have an opportunity to flank them. This is where the heat rounds come in handy easily penetrating the upper glacy plate of the IS-3 from any distance. But let's not forget that any heat round is an HE round as well. It carries a decent amount of explosives. That means it's quite capable of breaking the hull of a light tank that, oh, look, appears from round the corner. Like this. Also, a single shot with its round can destroy an annoying SBAAG trying to break your barrel. Further studies and experiments showed that the rotation of the projectile significantly hinders the formation of a cumulative jet, and rotation was a crucial thing in those days. It gave projectiles the necessary stability in flight. But over time, designers started moving on to smooth bore weapons and stabilizing rounds with fins. This gave an additional powerful impulse to the development of heat rounds, because their penetration just significantly improved. For example, the Soviet 3BK-15M heat projectile that's part of the arsenal of the T-62M1 medium tank penetrates up to 500 millimeters of armor. <laughs> nice improvement indeed. The effectiveness of the cumulative effect doesn't depend on the speed of the projectile so it turned out to be very popular in another promising form of ammunition, anti-tank guided missiles. One couldn't even dream of speeding an ATGM up to APFSDS comparable velocity thanks to its traction engine. Moreover, it would be difficult to control the missile at such a speed anyway. On the other hand, these missiles are perfectly capable of delivering a heat warhead to the target. Ultimately, the engineers received an ideal projectile. Its penetration wasn't diminishing with increased distance, and the accuracy depended only on the operator. The tremendous effectiveness of guided missiles led to the creation of the Soviet IT-1 tank, a machine that relied solely on ATGMs and didn't even have a classic weapon. With the recent update, a very unusual round was added to the game. It's called the M830A1, and it deserves its own screen time. This is a sub-caliber heat round with a proximity fuse, available in the Abrams M1A2 ammunition kit. And you might ask, why would you make a sub-caliber heat round? After all, the main feature of all subcaliber rounds is the projectile's increased velocity. But, as we remember, speed doesn't affect a heat round's penetration rate. No, it doesn't. But 
Speed is also quite useful if you're shooting at a distant and fast-moving target. For example, an enemy helicopter. Moreover, you don't need to hit it directly because that proximity fuse gives you the opportunity to miss the target, just not too much. A blast wave from almost 1,500 grams of TNT equivalent explosives will be more than enough for any helicopter. Overall, this is an original and very versatile round. If you're fighting enemies on the ground, it works like an ordinary heat projectile, albeit not the most powerful one. But when you're shooting at air targets, its other advantages are revealed. A proximity fuse, combined with a speed of up to 1,410 meters per second, leaves the enemy almost no time to maneuver. The widespread use of heat ammunition has led to the emergence of reactive armor. When triggered, it disperses the cumulative stream, thereby significantly reducing armor penetration. To overcome this effect, ATGM developers went for a simple trick, placing two cumulative charges sequentially in tandem. The first charge triggers the reactive armor block, and the second one pierces the now undisclosed area of the tank. In the game, there are already two vehicles that have missiles with a tandem warhead the Sturm S missile carrier and the BMP 3 light tank. Yet, Another new machine added in the update 1.93. That's probably everything we wanted to tell you about the types of heat rounds and how to use them. And now it's time to answer your questions that you ask in the comments. The first message was sent by a player called Star Wars Niels. What are these things? Scopes? On the naval guns of Japanese ships? Yep, you got it right. These are exactly the scopes. Not just on Japanese ships, though. Here's one of them on American Asheville motor gunboat, for example. A user called Juarez1 asks, Do you have an idea of separating propeller and jet fighters? Early jets are killing me! <laughs> Wait! Isn't this a game where one plane shoots another one down? Uh, let me check, just in case. Yeah, that's the one. Now for a more serious answer. The early jets don't really show some undeniable superiority against the late piston engine planes. Yes, they're faster, but they're a lot less maneuverable, and you can easily dominate them in a dogfight. If you want to lure such an opponent into one, it's usually enough to evade his initial attack and then counter-attack on your own. He'll be forced to maneuver and lose speed. Then there is a question sent by Mika van Dommelen. Does it matter how much fuel you take in air battles? It does indeed. The amount of fuel changes the mass of the aircraft, same as the amount of ammo, and the mass of the plane seriously affects its flight parameters. You can easily feel it while playing. The lighter the aircraft is itself, and the more part of its mass is taken with fuel, the easier it is to spot the difference. Another question came from Mike Horton. Can you please create how-to video for radar systems in-game? Really would appreciate how to get the most out of it and more on systems like IFF. Hi there, thanks for the idea. We'll try to focus on it in one of the upcoming episodes of The Shooting Range. And the last question for today was written by Jonathan Stiles. Why don't you use knots to measure aircraft and ship speed in your videos? Or more importantly, by default in the game? Most forces IRL do so as far as I know. In the game, we've given you the option to use the measurements that you like. It can be switched in main parameters and then measurement units. We've done so because different players feel comfortable with different measurements. Those who mostly fight on the ground often prefer their habitual kilometers per hour, and big fans of naval battles, of course, tend to measure their speed in knots. Well, that's it for today, folks. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. So, come on, you lot. Subscribe to the channel and load heat rounds, boom, 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 and press that bell button. Now you gotta leave a like and tell us what you think in the comments below. 
See you in a week. <laughs>